Well, again, a huge congratulations to our graduating class. Uh, this is such a neat group of, of seniors. Uh, I'm, I'm hugely going to miss them. They are a fun, fun group of people. You're not going to spend time with this group and not end up with a smile on your face at some point. They, they'll make you laugh. They know how to have a good time. And uh, just enjoy each and every one of them. But in addition to being fun, uh, these guys are men and women of character. And they're dedicated. They're committed. Um, and if I could think of a term to describe this group, it's servant leaders. Uh, each and every one of them has been involved in ministry, both in our student ministry as well as the, the church and their schools, um, sports teams. Uh, they're just a, a neat, neat group of, of folks, and I'm excited for what God's going to do in and through you guys um, from this point on. So congratulations to each one of you guys. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm the student pastor here at Covenant. Uh, the gal who prayed uh, over is Erin Allen. She's the associate director of student ministries. And uh, my, my sentiment indicator is going off the charts this morning for a couple of reasons. Uh, I look at this class and it just kind of blows my mind. Uh, one of the graduates uh, was the daughter of my student pastor uh, when I came in here as the seventh grader uh, a couple of years ago. And... Um, Another one of these graduates is the daughter of the student pastor who I got to work for when I first started 10 years ago. And then as many of you know, this will be the last class that I graduate um, as the student pastor here at Covenant. And so I'm going to try to keep it together as best as possible, but this is a, this is a, a great morning and I'm excited. So um, as I was kind of considering what to share with you guys this morning, uh, I went through Psalm 1 as Grace just read and uh, in my quiet time earlier in the month, I was just reminded of its simplicity, but also its power and so I thought it'd be a good thing to, to share with you guys this morning. And I also remember this particular passage uh, kind of has some nostalgia for me. Uh, when my dad used to do uh, family devotions when we were younger, this passage in particular was one that, um, that was kind of a staple in our home. I remember hearing it quite often. And, you know, my dad in that moment was really doing some spiritual warfare on behalf of his family. I think any time a parent opens up the word, uh, he's battling on behalf of the hearts and, and souls of his children. But I tell you what, when you're outnumbered like my dad was, you know, four to, four to one, five to one, uh, all those being little boys, and those guys would much rather wrestle or poke each other or tickle each other or fight than to listen uh, to what he has to say, uh, that idea of warfare, um, well, you can, you can imagine. Uh, but, but through it all, uh, this, this particular passage impacted my life in a profound way, so I'm excited to share it with you this morning. So let's pray, and then, uh, then we'll get into it. All right, let's pray. God, we're grateful to be here this morning. Lord, I'm thankful for these, these graduates, the class of 2016, and I'm excited for what you're going to do in and through them. And Lord, as we look at your word, Lord, I pray that you'd speak through me. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would uh, illuminate um, the hearts and minds of, of all of us here, that as we hear your word, we might uh, respond. And God, thank you for this church. Thank you for um, the opportunity to be here together. And Lord, we, uh, we praise you. Amen. All right. The 20th century pastor, um, the English pastor, author, and biblical commentator, W. Graham Scroge. Am I saying that right? Scroge? Scroge? Carlin's, yeah, something. Uh, he, he said about this passage, Psalm 1, that though it is short in its size, it, is, it has length and strength as to its matter. All right. Though it is short in its size, it has length and strength as to its matter. I'd like to think you could say the same thing about your speaker this morning, but uh, maybe I'm afraid that only the first part of that statement is applicable. Uh, yeah, in six verses of Psalm 1, uh, we're going to see kind of laid out for us the path of the righteous, right? It's going to depict what the righteous man does, what he does not do, right? Scroge goes on to, uh, to describe this passage by saying this is basically the Christian guide, and in it we see the quicksand where the wicked sink and the solid ground in which the godly stand firm. So let's get right into it. Verse 1 says, blessed is the man. I think right out of the gate there's reason to pause. I believe this idea of blessing um, or the idea of being blessed is one that deserves a little bit of explanation, right? I think it deserves some explanation because the idea of blessing um, biblically kind of differs, not kind of, uh, differs in a lot, a lot of ways from um, our cultural definition of the idea of being blessed, right? It's kind of gotten muddled in, in a lot of ways, right? Where our culture would define being blessed or blessing maybe in terms of material gain or prosperity or uh, positive circumstances, uh, the Bible isn't going to necessarily define that in that way. 
all right? And we see this all throughout our culture. A quick search of Instagram, the term hashtag blessed, and what you're gonna see is a whole gaggle of millennials taking selfies with their sports cars or big homes or their most prized possessions. And listen, I'm not hating. Uh, I'm guilty of doing that, as you can see. <laughs> That's me and my most prized possession, my 2002 minivan. And you think I'm joking, I still can love that thing. <laughs> Uh, I'm a minivan guy. That thing can hold a drum set, three kids, and like six cups. It's awesome. So you can keep your Corvette. I'm a minivan guy. And yes, I turned in my man card. So we're good. But the idea of blessing. So the point is that we've, we've turned this idea of blessing of talking about, well, oh man, I got this new thing. Or I experienced this, this great circumstance where things are really going positive for me. I'm, I'm blessed. And the Bible is going to um, differ slightly in, in what it means. So what is blessing? What does it mean to be blessed? And the word here could be simply defined as fortunate or happy, but is under the idea that happiness is found in the fact that we have a sovereign, loving God who providentially cares for our lives, allowing things into our life that are going to push us more towards him, that are going to shape us and mold us into the people he wants us to be. It's a condition, not an action. Does that make sense? So to be blessed means that you are under the sovereign care of a loving father who desires that you are drawn to his heart and live according to his principles because that is the best thing for you. This makes sense of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says uh, kind of semi-paradoxical statements like blessed are the persecuted, right? Or blessed are those who mourn. Those aren't, those aren't circumstances in which we would call desirable necessarily, but the people who are persecuted because of Jesus, the people who are mourning because of their faith, are comforted by God, right? Or they get God in the end. This is the idea of being blessed, that we are pushed in a Godward direction because of the things that God allows in our life, because he cares about us. And he knows that the best thing for us is that we ultimately get God, right? So that's just the first word of this passage, blessed. We gotta move on, uh, gotta pick up the pace. All right, so the second word is is. Is is a linking verb. It can, no, I'm kidding. The rest of this verse uh, it goes on to say, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. One commentator acknowledged that this first verse is kind of made up of a triple triplet, right? So in that we see three different components, three different ways. Walks, standing, sitting, counsel, way, seat, and that third one being the wicked, sinners and scoffers. In this, we see a progression that once a person becomes involved in sin, it is a downward spiral away from the heart of God. Yeah. The one who commits their life to sin, who rejects God, there's a downward spiral away from his heart and his, uh, his desire for all people. These are fundamental, decisive departures from God's ways, and the godless person is choosing and carrying out their allegiance, and the righteous person has nothing to do with it. So we're gonna describe the righteous person first in the negative. What does the righteous person not do? Well, it says he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Okay, this idea of walking in the counsel of the wicked has to do with thinking or your thought life. The godly man, the happy man, lives his life according to the instruction of God's word, right? The principles found in the scriptures. He adheres to them, he lives according to them. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but I think this is so significant that it says the blessed man, the righteous man, doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked because we live in a day and age where we are bombarded by counsel, right? Whether it be television or radio or movies or social media, we are, we are given counsel and suggestions on how to walk, how to live, what is truth, what is right, what we should give our heart to on a daily basis, often unsolicited, right? But the wise person is able to acknowledge what is truth and what is false according to God's word. Uh, I was reminded of a, an analogy when I was younger. I was, I was uh, taught this, and I think it applies, that those responsible for catching counterfeit currency, right, the FBI or whoever it might be, um, what they do is they familiarize themselves so much with the authentic that they can immediately recognize a fake, right? They don't, they don't try to figure out all the fakes or figure out if it's fake simply by knowing that. They know the, the real thing and it becomes immediately obvious what's fake. And I think that's what's true here is the man of God, the righteous man, the blessed man, knows God's word and holds fast to it so that when false things are said or communicated, he's able to reject those. All right, so that's the first one, walks not in the counsel of the wicked. The second one 
nor stands in the way of sinners. This has to do with the idea of behavior or behaving. If an Oklahoman were to write this line, he would ask the question, who are you hitching your wagon to? Right? Who are you hitching your wagon to? The Bible speaks here and numerous other places uh, the idea that we are profoundly shaped by the people that we allow in our life, right? Both for the good, for the bad, right? I speak to my students all the time about this. Who are the people you are allowing to influence your life? Who are the people that you are surrounding yourself by that have a voice that's going to help shape who you are? Are they people that are gonna spur you on towards righteousness, loving God, knowing him, walking in his ways? Or are they people who are gonna draw you away from that? And that is applicable for the three-year-old up through the hundred-year-old, right? That we all are affected, all shaped by the people that we surround ourselves. right? Now, this isn't a call towards insulating ourselves from the outside world or non-believers. I think the gospels are pretty clear that we are to go and shine light into the world. But this has to do with the idea of who are you allowing to have a voice into your heart, into your mind, into your life that's going to shape who you are. The next one, the last one of the triple is. We looked at, we looked at thinking, we looked at behaving. Um, this last one, uh, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This has to do with the idea of belonging, right, or allegiance. This is kind of the climax of this downward spiral of the sinner. The scoffer is the one who is farthest from the heart of God, right? The scoffer not only relishes in his sin, but he scoffs at the idea of needing a savior. He scoffs at the idea of needing to repent or be made right, thinks he's right in and of himself. The happy man, the righteous man, is keenly aware of his own sin and his need to be forgiven and has a steady diet of repentance as part of his spiritual daily life. Okay, so that's the first three. The blessed man, or the, uh, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. It's gonna switch to the positive in verse two. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, he meditates both day and night. So how does a man, how does a person not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers? Well, he commits his life once again to God's word, right? The righteous man, the happy man is a Bible man, right? person does this by committing to God's word, knowing its truth, and giving his heart and his soul to God's word. The scriptures are the revealed will of God, the counsel of the creator of the universe. Yep. And the righteous man gives his heart to those and rejects fundamentally anything else from this world. Uh, one of my favorite preachers once said this quote. He said, the Bible will keep you away from sin and sin will keep you away from the Bible. Right? The Bible will keep you away from sin and sin will keep you away from the Bible. You guys remember when Carlin said that? I think that was a powerful, powerful statement and a, a truth that, that is extremely uh, applicable. He says he meditates on this truth day and night. This idea that whatever shapes your thinking, whatever um, you ponder and consider, it's going to eventually shape your life, right? Whatever we kind of give our mind to, it's going to shape how we live out and how we behave. Uh, in this passage, as well as in Joshua 8 and other places in Scripture, uh, we see that the godly life is centered around God's word and a commitment to it. This idea of meditation is not emptying one's mind, right? Like we hear about in other world religions. It's not um, trying to find Zen or Nirvana or whatever, but rather it is a, a deep pondering, a deep thinking about. It's the picture of going to a well that never runs dry and continuing to draw, knowing that you can continue, no matter how many times you dip your bucket, continue to pull something out of it. The scriptures are inexhaustible when it comes to their application to our lives. So there's a reason to continue to go through them always. This idea of delight is a seemingly counterintuitive statement, right? Delighting in the law. That's, a, that's an interesting statement. Often people look at the scriptures and they see it as a rule book, right? They see it as constricting or oppressive, right? Th do's and don'ts. Things are gonna keep me from doing the things that I wanna do. But the righteous man, the godly man, that doesn't see it so much as a restriction as, as much as it is a, a benefit to the life of the believer, right? The wise person recognizes that the... Um, that the Bible will spur them on towards righteousness. 
It's going to lead to protection, preservation, prosperity, security, and vitality. I've got to see this play out in kind of a funny way in my, my home. Uh, my wife and I, my, my two children, we just moved in with our in-laws, um, and they have a, a beautiful home. It's got two stories and a, a grand staircase, which the staircase um, has become the new favorite play toy of my two toddlers, uh, which isn't good. And uh, one day, um, I'm going to blame myself here, uh, we kind of got mixed up on our coverage, and Claire got away from us, and when we heard the thump, 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 right? and the screams that followed. And sure enough, Claire had taken a tumble down the stairs. She's fine. And I know what you're thinking. Man, that's bad parenting. But if you know Claire, you'd be like, only once? No, that's pretty decent parenting. That's not bad. <laughs> that kid is out of control. But to prevent this from happening further, we, we installed a baby gate. And she was not a happy camper about this baby gate. It, it restricted her access to the stairs. And uh, she feels imprisoned, right? So in her little mind, she says, you're, you're keeping me from fun, right? You're preventing me from getting to the thing that I want the most. But in my, my mind, as the more mature, more wise person, I know that this is protecting her, right? This is keeping her from falling to her death, right? Or breaking her neck or something, right? It is put, it is a restriction put in place for her, her preservation, her protection, her vitality. And this is what the wise man, the righteous man, the blessed man sees the scriptures as. That's how we delight in them. Does that make sense? We delight because we understand they're not to restrict our freedom, but rather to give us freedom. Let me find my place here. Verse 3 says, He is like a tree. So we're going to start to see the result of walking in righteousness, the results of avoiding the path of sin. It says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. His leaf does not wither. So this is a picture of a well-established established tree, right? One that is um, planted right next to its source of nourishment. Uh, it is going to avoid degradation because it has everything it needs to uh, not only survive but thrive. And it's going to produce a fruit that is beneficial to itself and to others. That is the picture of the man who gives his heart and his life to God's ways and God's scripture, right? That you will experience spiritual vitality and strength that you will be able to produce a godly fruit that is beneficial not only for yourself, but for others, for your church. And then the al alternative, the wicked are not so, verse four, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, I'm not a farmer, but from what I've read and what I understand, the process of, of thrashing wheat uh, involves cracking this chaff off of the seed of the grain, right? And the seed is weighty and it's useful and it's purposeful, but the chaff is kind of like the husk and it's, it's pointless and it's purposeless and it's weightless. And then what the farmer would do is on a windy day, he would gather this and he would break the two apart. And then from an elevated position, he would toss the two into the air, right? And the weighty, important, significant seed would fall back to the earth to be gathered and used while the chaff would be carried by the wind, pointless, scattered, never to be used again. All right, this is the picture of futility, right? The futile life without God. And it is the picture of the wicked who are separated from their creator. Verse five. With that picture in mind, it says, um, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This is a sombering reminder that those who are not righteous have no leg to stand on when they stand before a holy God. They have no defense There's a day coming when the saints and the sinners will be separated and the sinner has no place among God's people. Right? It's a heavy reality. Verse six says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And we'll kind of start closing out with this. This idea of knowing that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This isn't a knowledge necessarily. It has more to do with the idea of intimacy or ownership or um, identifying with. So God knows the way of the righteous. He identifies with us. He, he leads his, himself with us. He cares about us. He, he owns us in that process. And so the reminder is, yes, it is a blessing to walk in the way of righteousness. It is a blessing to um, follow God's path. But we have to understand ultimately that our righteousness does not come from ourselves. It comes from Jesus Christ. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21, one of my favorite passages in scripture, says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm gonna read that again. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We avoid sin, we walk in God's truth, we experience a life of righteousness, not because of any good that we've done, but because of the good that's been done on our behalf. Right? Jesus goes to the cross, he dies in our place, the wrath of God towards sin, the just wrath of God towards sin is exhausted on him that we might not have to face it. And then it says, we get to make the greatest exchange in human history, that Christ gets our sin and the punishment thereof, and we get his righteousness. It's good news, right? Yes? That when God looks at me, God looks at you, he doesn't see sin and rebellion. What he sees is the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed into our account for those who have placed their faith in Jesus. The end of this passage says, but the way of the wicked will perish. There are two distinct paths, two distinct final eternal destinations, right? That is the, the good and the bad news of the gospel. The bad news is that we are separated from our creator because of our sin. But the good news is that by Jesus, God has made a way for us to be made right, to be made righteous, so that we can walk in the path of righteous, and not in the way of wickedness. So I'm gonna close, um, and we're gonna cl close a little early so that we can have some time to uh, take some pictures with the seniors and their families. But I wanna close with a few significant questions. First question is, do you have the righteousness of Christ imputed into your account? Have you had your sin problem taken care of by the free gift offered to you, the free gift of salvation offered to you by God through Jesus? He simply asks that we put our faith in him, believe Jesus is who he said he is, the Messiah, the one who came to take care of the problems of sin. And then we are given entrance into God's family as a child of the king, no longer enemies of God, but, but his children. So do you have the righteousness of Jesus? If you do not, if you're sitting there and you say, I, I sit guilty of my own sin, man, please come talk to myself or to Carlin or any of the elders or pastors. We would love, love more than anything this morning to celebrate with you what it means to place your faith in Jesus and become a child of, of God. And then to the believer, I would ask these questions. Is the word of God central in your life? Are you making the Bible, the scriptures, a priority in your life? Are you delighting in the law of God? Is it shaping who you are? Is it molding you and your family? Is the Bible central? Are you delighting in God's word? Um, in closing, um, as many of you know, I, uh, I'll be stepping down from my position as the student minister at Covenant. And I just want to, uh, I don't want to make this about me too much, but I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to say uh, an enormous thank you on behalf of myself and my family uh, for 10 wonderful years of, of ministry in this church. Um, you've, you've really got to watch me grow up. And when you watch somebody grow up, you get the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so thank you for sticking with me um, through all those, those years. Um, I will look back on these years with nothing but, but fondness. Uh, I still have a heart for students um, catching a vision for ministry. Uh, that won't change. Uh, so I will continue to be a minister of the gospel. I'm just going to get uh, a different occupation. But I'm so grateful to this church and all the people who have supported me all along the way. So thank you so much for that. Let's pray. God, we are grateful to you for loving us and showing mercy and grace to us enough that you would send your one and only son that those who might believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Thank you for imputing the righteousness of Christ into our account when we did not deserve it so that when you see us, you don't see our sin and our shame and our, our guilt, but rather you see the righteousness, the purity of Jesus who took our place and Lord, I pray that we would understand that we are blessed because you care about us and you are shaping us and molding us. You are allowing things into our lives that are going to steer us Godward versus into this world. And Lord, where we 
stumble and where we fail and where we sin, Lord, may we be quick to repent and quick to experience your uh, forgiveness and your cleansing power. God, thank you so much for your grace in our life. Lord, I pray that you would establish each and every person in this room like a tree because they center their lives around your word. They center their lives around the truth of the scriptures and they experience um, the fruit that comes from that. We thank you for your love for us. And I pray, amen.